Hello, today's lesson is going to be about postulates and paragraph proofs. <clears throat> In order to talk about postulates, you have to first know, of course, what they are. A postulate or an axiom um, is a statement in geometry that describes a very basic relationship between geometric terms. Um, postulates are ideas that are considered to be so fundamental, so basic, that they actually do not have to be proven. These are sort of the building blocks for which everything else in geometry comes from. So among mathematicians, when you come up with a new idea, of course you have to prove that your idea is true. No one's going to take it at face value and say, okay, Miss Miller said so, therefore it must be true. I'm gonna have to back an argument or prove that something's true. Well, these postulates are the only thing that are considered so easy, so basic, that they are assumed without proof. And actually, we've discussed several of these postulates before. For example, we talked about the first one that says, through any two points, there has to be exactly only one line. So if I give you two points, there's only one possible way to connect those two points to make a line. We also talked about the second postulate. Through any three points that are not on the same line, that are non-collinear, there's only one possible plane that contains all three of those points. We also talked about the third postulate. A line must contain at least two points. Remember, of course, that a line actually has infinitely many, but the minimum number of points that we talk about would need to be at least two. Minimum of two, of course, we know there are infinitely many in real life. Same concept for the plane. If I were to give you a plane, we all know that at minimum there must be three points on that plane, but really there are infinitely many. Notice that the first and the third postulate are very similar, but also notice that the order of the terms is flipped. They're kind of like the converse of each other. The first postulate says, first you have two points, therefore there is a line. The third postulate is backwards. First I have a line, and then that means I know there must be at least two points. Be careful of the order of the items. That's going to become important as we look at examples. The same is true of the second and the last postulate. Those are very closely related again, um, but the order of the terms is important. Okay, three things that we may not have necessarily talked about. The next postulate says that if two points lie in a plane, so here's my plane, here are two points, then this postulate says the whole line that contains those points must also lie in the plane. And the last two we have talked about. In the last one, it says if two lines intersect, their intersection is exactly one point. We actually learned that in probably the first lesson. Two lines always intersect at exactly one point. And the next one, if two planes intersect, their intersection is always a line. So for example, here, these two planes may intersect here or perhaps a better figure for that. If I were to give you a cube, for example, each of the sides of the cube, each of the faces is a plane. If you focus on the front and the top of the cube, notice their intersection is this edge. And remember, since planes continue forever, their intersection continues forever as well, would be a line. You do need to know all seven of these postulates. You don't necessarily need to memorize them word for word, but you do have to understand the concepts behind them. These postulates don't have specific names, so you can't shortcut them like postulate one, two, three, four, five. Those numbers would be arbitrary. When we use them, you're going to have to actually write out the postulate. Back in the first chapter, we talked about a question that's similar to this. It says, Jesse's setting up a network for his mother's business. There are five computers in her office. So one, two, three, four, five. 
He wants to connect each computer to all of the other computers so that if one of them fails, their connection still exists. How many connections does Jesse need to make? So we talked about how we could make a picture, connect each dot, in this case computer, to each of the other dots like this and count as we go. Or remember the other option was to look at the factorial. If there are five dots, then we can multiply four times three times two times one excuse me, not factorial, add those numbers. Add all the numbers below the number of dots, not factorial, factorial is multiplying. And there should be 10 unique connections. What does that have to do with this? Well, that goes with the postulate that says between any two points, there's exactly one line. So between each of those computers, we can make a unique connection. Now using our postulates, determine whether each statement is sometimes always or never true. Number one, if points A, B, and C lie on plane M, then they are collinear. This one I think should be obvious. This is definitely a sometimes. Just because three points lie on a plane does not mean they have to be in a straight line, but they could be on a straight line. There's exactly one plane that contains non-collinear points P, Q, and R. This is actually one of those postulates. Through any three points not on the same line, there's exactly one plane. Therefore, this one must be always true. Number three, through at least, there are at least two lines through any points M and N. This contradicts one of our postulates. This is never true. Remember that between two points, there's only one, exactly one, line. Plane R and plane S intersect at point T. This one is also never true. Our postulate says that two planes always intersect at a line. Therefore, they will never intersect at just a point. And finally, two lines intersect at points X and Y. This is also a never. Two lines intersect at exactly one point. Exactly one point. When you take postulates and the basic ideas of geometry and you use them to come up with other ideas, some of the more complex ideas in geometry are called theorems. Theorems are ideas, statements, conjectures that do have to be proven among the mathematical community. And we actually will be proving lots of different math ideas, just like mathematicians. The first theorem, although you didn't hear the word, you have learned before, and that's called the midpoint theorem. The midpoint theorem says that M is the midpoint of line segment AB. So we would start out with a picture that looks something like this. Here's M. I know that it is the midpoint, smack dab in the middle, between points A and B. The midpoint theorem is what allows us to know that because it's a midpoint, cuts the line segment in half, the halves are the same, and we can conclude that line segment AM is congruent to line segment MB. So we already know the concept. Here's a name for it. Midpoint theorem tells us if we have a midpoint, then the two halves are congruent. Okay, in the next set of examples in the figure, line BD and line BR are in plane P, and W is also on line BD. State the postulate or definition that can be used to show that each statement is true. So we know that these statements are true, your job is to justify. How do we know that they are true? So in question number six, it says points B, D, and W are collinear. Points B, D, and W are collinear. Well, there are three points all on the same line, right? Well, we know a line has infinitely many points. How do we know that? The third postulate. It says that a line must contain
at least two points. Therefore, it could have three, like B, D, and W. Number seven, points E, B, and R are coplanar. If you take a look at the picture, here's E, B, and R. Although there is no plane drawn on the figure, there does exist a plane through those three non-collinear points. How do we know that? The second postulate. It says through three non-collinear points, there is exactly one plane. And for the last one, it says points R and W are collinear. Again, if you look at the picture, it doesn't appear as though R and W sit on the same line. But we know that through any two points, we can create a line. There exists a line. And that was the first postulate. So number eight can be justified by saying through any two points. There is exactly one line. As we get into more complicated ideas, and I mentioned that theorems, for example, are more uh, meteor, let's say, ideas that do have to be proven. There are several different ways to write proofs. Uh, the first one's going to be a paragraph proof, and we're going to do a few of them, but not too many. Most of what we're going to study are um, two-column proofs, where it's set up sort of like a table. Proofs do the same thing regardless of the type. Paragraph proofs are basically written out like a paragraph in a paragraph, whereas the two-column proofs are set up like a table. But the information is the same. So a paragraph proof is more informal. Uh, it's an explanation, basically, of why something is true. So not just one postulate or one theorem, but how do you get from point A to B? Why is a certain statement true? How do you justify it using things that we know already are true? So in leading up to that, these few questions give you a statement that is true. Your job is to come up with a conjecture or a conclusion. But not only do you have to come up with a conjecture, but you also have to justify it. How do you know that's true? Why is that true? You may have to think back to some of the definitions, properties, terms that we've already learned, as well as the postulates and theorem from this section. So if you take a look at number nine, number nine says that B is the midpoint of line segment AC. So here's my line segment AC. If I know that B is the midpoint, one of the things that I can conclude is that line segment AB and line segment BC are congruent. If I have a midpoint, I know that means the two halves are the same. How do I know that? The midpoint theorem. You're welcome to abbreviate theorem THM if you would like. Number 10 says points J, K, and L are collinear. So here's my line. But it also tells me that J, K has the same measure as line K, L. In order for that to be true, my, lines, my points would have to be put on the line like this. If J, K, and K, L are the same thing, think about what we know about point K. That makes point K the midpoint. So for our conclusion, we could say K is the midpoint of line segment JL. Notice this is really similar to question number nine. But again, the order of the items is different. In number nine, we had the word midpoint, and that allowed us to conclude the two halves are the same. 
In number 10, it's backwards. First, we know there's some line segment where the two halves are the same. Therefore, we can call that middle point the midpoint. In number 10, where you have the segments of equal length first, and then you conclude that that means a certain point is the midpoint, that's actually the definition of a midpoint. And that's something that we learned in chapter one. We'll go over the difference between these two things again, probably several times, but be very careful. They seem similar, but midpoint theorem definition of midpoint are actually two different justifications. Question number 11, we're given that two angles are congruent. So there may be lots of different conjectures or conclusions that we can come up with. One of them, if I know two angles have equal measure, that means that those two angles must be congruent. So for my conclusion, I'm going to say angle GRS is congruent to angle SRL. And we've used this before many times, but not necessarily had to write a um, justification for it. The justification, however, is the definition of congruence or congruent. What does it mean for two angles to be congruent? It means they have the same measure. And finally, in question number 12, we're given that two angles are complementary. Angle one and angle two are complementary. Well, we should all know what that term complementary means. It means that those two angles add up to 90. So for my conclusion, to write that mathematically, I would say the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two equals 90 degrees. How do I know? That's what it means to be complementary. So for my justification, I can say the definition of complementary. In class tomorrow, we'll do a lot of practice questions using the different postulates, theorems, definitions, rules that we have learned so far, coming up with conclusions based on different statements. Please bring any questions that you have to class tomorrow. We'll make sure we go over them. Have a good day.